Has your name ever been in the paper? I have to say, if I be honest, there is something sort of exciting about reading one's name in the paper. As long as it's not in the arrest records or the obituaries, right? My name has made it into the paper a few times, uh, and for the most part, I haven't been embarrassed by it being there, except for one occasion. I was singing in a program that the Greater Anderson Musical Arts Chorale was performing one year, and it was being announced in the paper, including soloists for the program. Now, I don't know if the proofreader for the Anderson Independent was asleep that day, or was an unknown or secret enemy of mine, but the article read, and soloists for the program are so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and dirt slut. <laughs> D-I-R-T S-L-U-T-T-E-R. That is not how my name is spelled. At least I don't think it said the Reverend Dirk Slug. Can you imagine, though, if your name made it into the best-selling work of literature of all time? Can you imagine if your name was mentioned in a book that sold more copies across the world than any other book in all of human history? Hundreds of millions of copies sold the number one bestseller every year for about 400 years. Can you imagine? Would that be exciting or what? I wonder if they were here today, what, Eodia and Sintaki would think about their names being in that book, the Bible. Did you catch the names that Michelle read, Paul addressing those two ladies? Maybe they wouldn't be so excited for their names to be mentioned. It's probably just as true to say they probably had no idea that they would be remembered down through the history of the Christian church as the two women in the church of Philippi who were fussing and feuding each other. They probably never imagined that their legacy in history would be the fact that they could not get along. They had the potential for being remembered for so much more. As scholars now look back into the scriptures, looking for a more balanced approach, looking for women to recognize and hold up as participants in the work of God's people, these two women could have been excellent examples. If we ever needed evidence that Paul, the Apostle Paul, lived a better theology than sometimes he wrote, all we have to do is listen to his comments about how important and significant he says these two women were in the work of organizing and leading the church. Now, Paul may have said at some point in his writings that women need to keep their mouths shut in church. But Eodia and Syntaki labored side by side with Paul in teaching, in preaching, in organizing, and in running the church. These two were exceptional and gifted women who had made significant efforts on behalf of the church at Philippi, and now they're at odds with each other. We have no idea what it was. It might have been theological. It might have been church politics. It might have been personal. It might have been about children. But they surely had no idea that this fight that was between them would, would be the only reason they would ever be remembered. You wonder if the fight would have been as important to them if they had known the fight was all that they would be remembered for. Is there any fight you're having or have ever had that's significant enough to be remembered for 2,000 years? You know, my wife and I, once in a while, have a disagreement. 
and we try to have a policy not to let the sun go down on our arguments, not to go to bed angry with each other. Do you have that policy? Hasn't always worked. <laughs> and sometimes a day or two or three will go by those hours of not talking to each other, but then life goes on and you begin talking again and other things come up and you find something funny happens and you laugh. And on more than one occasion she said, oh, I forgot I was mad at you. <laughs> we really have no idea what these two women were so upset about and why they were at odds with each other. They had no idea that the quarrel would be the only thing they'd be remembered for because, you see, they had no idea that Paul would dare mention this in his letter. But it's obvious that it's no small thing. It was a significant issue. There was a deep tear in the body of Christ, and Paul mentions it. This is no inconsequential matter. It's important because it's a quarrel between two leaders, between two major people in the church. It's a split that is affecting and it's harming the life of the whole church. We know it's a significant issue because Paul chose to mention it in the letter that will be read publicly before the whole church. But you notice Paul mentions it in a very careful way. He's very diplomatic. He entreats Eodia. And he uses the exact same word. He entreats Syntaki. And you know, he mentions the names of the women in alphabetical order so that he doesn't show preference. He urges them to find a way to come together in Christ Jesus. They had no idea that Paul would dare mention the split and quarrel in his public letter. But Paul makes it the first thing he says when he comes to the last chapter and begins his summary instructions. Paul says it right out loud in front of everybody because somehow Paul really believes that it's part of the work of the church. It's part of the responsibility of the people of God. It is the mission of Christ's followers to be agents of God's reconciliation. Paul mentions the conflict publicly because it's the public work of the people of God to work to make peace. Blessed are who the peacemakers. For the people who have received the grace of God perhaps need to be the ones who bear witness to that grace by acting out of the grace of God. It's not that the people of God will never have conflicts or quarrels. It hasn't happened here yet, but we're only three months old. You know, there's a name for a church or a religiously ordained group of people who never ever have a disagreement, who do everything their leaders ask them to do, who never ask any question. There's a name for a group like that. It's called a cult. <laughs> and if you ever find yourself in such a place, leave it immediately. And if anyone you love goes to such a church, encourage them to get out of it as soon as possible. For unity is not uniformity. The people of God, the church, ought to be the place where differences are expressed and quarrels acknowledged, but in Christ resolved. Paul believes this is how the church makes visible the reality of the love and grace of God, that people of God show the love and mercy of God to the world by working together to resolve their own conflicts and in this case, these two leaders bringing them together in peace. In an article in the Christian Century magazine, it is suggested that the kind of church that Paul has in mind tends to happen nowadays in the basement of many churches or in an upstairs Sunday school room, not in the sanctuary. It may never be able to happen in the sanctuary, but the kind of church that Paul has in mind happens in those groups where people come and they confess that they're having a problem. And the group together begins the real difficult, painful work of trying to help that person change. It is in AA groups where the group works to help the person move forward in life without drinking. It is in tough love parenting classes where parents and children come and acknowledge that they're in conflict and the group works to try to help parents establish boundaries and limits and to stick to those boundaries and to teach children how to negotiate maturity and change the boundaries. 
It's in guardian ad litem programs that meet in the church parlor for training where people know there's a conflict between three or four different sides and they're there to speak up for the child and to work towards some agreement. The church of Philippi probably had no more idea how to deal with these two women in worship when they heard that letter than we would know what to do if someone stood up in this sanctuary right now and acknowledged a quarrel before, with somebody else. For it's a great compliment to the church at Philippi that Paul mentions this quarrel and he calls them to be a part of a ministry of reconciliation. It was an affirmation that they had matured, that he thought they had developed in grace and an understanding of themselves as ministers of grace, that he could entrust to them the needs of these two women. And to believe that the church in their basement would find a way to help them become reconciled. That's what we've been given, the ministry of reconciliation. In the second letter, to the church at Corinth, another church that had lots of divisions and splits. Paul says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So you see, we are all ambassadors for Christ. Paul mentions this quarrel because two of his friends are in conflict and he believes it's the work of God's people to work with them to bring about reconciliation. But let us not be naive or kid ourselves. The work of reconciliation, of bringing opposing sides together, of repairing the breach of separation, of healing the brokenness of relationships. That is a tall order, and it involves much risk. There's always the danger of being drawn inside the conflict and asked to choose sides. Don't you agree with me, Pastor? Won't you take my side? Dear friend, we don't know the particulars of the conflict which divided Eodia and Sintaki, but we know it was impacting the whole church, and Paul would not choose sides. What it was, we don't know. We don't know what they were arguing over, but whatever it was, we can say for near certainty that like most conflicts, at the very root is a torn ego a rip in the fabric of self-worth and perceived value. Agree with me. Take my side. It is often a plea for affirmation. Tell me that I am somebody. The great challenge of those rips and tears is that they can rarely ever be patched by the methods we often try to use. Where there's not enough income or available credit to buy the repair through acquired things. There's not enough feel-good drugs, whether legal or not legal, that can patch the tear without ripping it further. There's not enough fame or religion or achievement or status or do my own thing for myself kind of activity that can plug that ever-widening hole inside. There's not even enough supportive words from friends or family that in the end can stop the leak, which leads to empty. Paul gives two suggestions for how to work through difficult situations like this. Whether those situations be at home or in the workplace or in the church, Paul says, pray. Instead of ruminating about what wrong has been done to you, pray. Give it over to God. And then in the words of that song, from Disney's Frozen. You know it. Let it go. Let it go. Pray for the person or persons with whom you're struggling. And if possible, pray with them. And then
then let it go. And then Paul gives us words that sound at first a little like Joel Osteen. You know that modern day prophet of positive thinking? Which Joel gives out every week, standing up there smiling before tens of thousands and millions more on TV and smiling all the way to the back. <laughs> Paul says, meditate, keep your mind on the right things. Keep your mind on what's true and noble and reputable and authentic and compelling and gracious. Keep your mind on the best not the worst, on the beautiful, not the ugly, on the things to praise, not the things to curse. Somehow, though, I don't put Paul and Joel Osteen in the same category. For Paul strikes me as much more grounded to the way things really are, not trying to sell us easy solutions to life's great challenges. Maybe where Paul is trying to take the church of Philippi, and where Paul is trying to take us today is to a personal relationship with an all-embracing God. A relationship that gets us out of ourselves. Out of our self-pity. Out of our self-denial. Out of our self-loathing. Out of our self-destructive behaviors. Gets us out of ourselves. Where Paul may be encouraging us to go is closer to what the great poet Ralph Waldo Emerson describes when he says the purpose of life is not to be happy. The purpose of life is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you lived and lived well. How do we repair the rips and tears in our sense that we map? How do we help people that we love and care about? And how do we help the world around us overcome the conflicts and find that peace which passes all understanding? The only real solution to the emptiness inside, Paul says, is that one relationship. That one relationship with the God who says to us. Now listen, this is what God says to us. All of us. No exceptions. I love you just the way you are. But I want to help you become all that I would like to see you be. That's what God says to us. Have you met that God? You know, that God shows up in some unlikely places sometimes. Who is that over yonder on that cross? Who is that standing beside those women next to an empty tomb? Who is that sitting in the room in the circle of the AA meeting. Who is that that comes to a run-down old mill village where the brokenness of life is just right out here in the open and says, let's form a church for all people? Who is that? I think I heard his name. Did you hear him? For what will you be remembered? On that day, when folks gather, maybe a few folks or maybe many, may a church full, may just be four or five by the graveside. On that day, when folks gather to spread your ashes or commit your body to the ground, for what will you? I don't know about you, but I pray that on that day, I'm remembered as 
simply someone who spoke that name, who honored that name, who introduced others to the one who's called by that name, Jesus. And in knowing the one called by that name, maybe folks will find you for all that is broken and divided in their lives. For what will you be remembered? Let's pray. <coughs> you want nothing more than a personal relationship with us, Lord. <coughs> Over the centuries, your witnesses have given that testimony been recorded in your written word, it's been lived through your people, that you want nothing more than a personal relationship with each one of us. Because you know what we sometimes don't know or have forgotten. That it is that personal relationship, it is only that personal relationship which can heal the terror Catch the rip, love the whole, help us to once and for all find wholeness and peace we breathe. So you're here today waiting, waiting to enter our hearts, waiting for us to invite you in. Give us courage to do 